Okay, let's go to Genesis chapter 24. We've been looking at the... <coughs> excuse me. We've been looking at the uh, Good Samaritan for some weeks, and um, we are definitely not through with that. And I wanted to talk about the oil and wine today, uh, just just the picture there. And But then I, I got to looking at it, and then he put him on his own beast, and then he carried him to the inn. A lot of good things to talk about. And um, some few messages back, I mentioned that I preached a message some 18 years ago entitled A Camel Called Grace. <laughs> and uh, so this week I pulled that thing out and dusted it off and just realized how inept I am at preaching, and <laughs> but worked on it. And I, I just want to talk about the grace of God this morning. And it looks like that that's what God's doing. I mean, through the singing this morning, what a friend we have in Jesus about prayer. Uh, Hebrews 4, about resting in prayer and coming to the throne of grace. And I think sometimes that we forget as believers and as children of, the God, of, of God, we, we forget that we are also not only the products of grace, but we are continually carried by grace. And I want to look at that, and, and you know, uh, I just pray the Lord a bless. I pray the Lord that you'll get a blessing out of it. Let's go to Genesis 24 and look at verses 10 and 11. I'm not going to go through the whole story, but verse 10 says, And the servant took ten camels out of the camels of his master and departed, for all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia and to the city of Nahor. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that the women go out to draw water. So now let's jump over to verse 61. And Rebecca arose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels and followed the man. And the servant took Rebecca and went his way. Now, <clears throat> in this this story that we see of, of Abraham sending his servant to go and fetch his son Isaac, a bride, is just one of the most beautiful pictures, I believe, of, of what Christ and God the Father did to bring his church. Amen. And uh, you all, I'm sure you well took well good heed to my message this morning about types. But we can definitely see a picture here. We can see an illustration how Abraham could be just like God the Father who sends his servant, the Holy Ghost, to reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come to the, to, uh, because of Isaac, his son, to come to the, to a far country, to Rebekah, who's a picture of the bride and, uh, the water of grace. And we, we see all those things. But what stood out to me some years ago, and I think now we want to speak about, is the camels. He sent him on. He sent the servant on camels. Uh, I, I want to look at the camels as a picture of grace today. It is grace that brings the Spirit of God to us through preaching. It is grace that gave us the Word of God. It is grace that caused God the Father to send His servant. For a bride, it is grace that carries the bride to its eternal position. It is grace that saves the soul. It is grace that changes the life. Amen. And what I did some time back, as I looked, uh, did some research on camels. You can just go to Google. I, of course, I didn't do any more research on camels. I'm sure I could have found a whole lot more. Um, but certainly, a camel is a good picture of grace in this story. And that's what I want to preach on, a camel called grace. Let, let's have a word of prayer. We'll get started. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would use your word to enlighten our minds. Father, that we could see grace. Uh, we, we talk of grace. We preach of grace. We're going to talk about grace a whole lot here in the next half hour or so. But Father, we definitely need your picture of grace. We need you to show us because, Lord, without you, we are nothing. We are hopelessly lost. We're in darkness. But Father, we need your grace. So give me the grace to preach. Give us the grace to hear. 
And Father, may we see this picture of grace that you so aptly have provided for us in the Word of God. Bless us now. We ask in Jesus' gracious name. Amen. Now before we go any further, let me go ahead and give you a summary of what grace is. Grace, first of all, by definition, we could call it unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. Uh, if, if a person uh, feels that they can work their way to God, then what they're doing is they are excluding the grace of God. The, the grace of God is the favor of God shown on men without man's merit. We see this in Genesis 6-2 where it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It is unmerited favor. Romans 11-6 gives us another picture. It says, And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Amen? So grace and works are the complete opposite of each other. We are saved by grace. That's why we sing this song, Amazing Grace. Because God looked down on us, and I love the song. It, it, it's an um, old Irish hymn, and it's, it's sung to the tune of Danny Boy. But it, it says that he looked beyond my fault and saw my need. Amen. You see, that's the grace of God. There's nothing that I could have done or can do currently to merit God's favor on me. It had to be God deciding He would show me mercy and love. That's His grace. That's who He is. Amen. Uh, it, it has an incredible impact in someone's life because Ephesians 2.8 says, for, uh, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. We are saved by grace. What an impact God's grace has had on mankind. And that you and I can praise God our Father and enjoy the presence of His Spirit and, and to fellowship with the Son and, and to experience the power of His Word and to also indulge in a life that, that can overcome sin. All these things is because God smiled on us in grace one day. Without the grace of God, none of that would be possible. Amen. What an impact. Now, this unmerited favor, let me point out something. I'm opposite of a Calvinist. Amen. I'm also the opposite of an Arminianist. I'm a Biblicist. These people that say grace is shown to some but not to others uh, do not read the Word of God and they have to change definitions. Amen? Uh, the Bible tells us in Titus 2.11 that grace has been shown to every man for the grace of God that bringeth forth salvation hath appeared to all men is what it says. That's what God says. It's appeared to all men. Just by the creation and the fact that you have life and air and breath is by the grace of God. Amen? And it's, and it's appropriate for you to look to the creation and say, there's got to be somebody in charge here. Amen? And He must be gracious to give me all these things that I don't deserve. Amen? Uh, it's been made available to all men. Amen? There's no such thing as some men get grace and others don't and all that. That's garbage. You have to throw out nine-tenths of Scripture if that's what you believe. Anyway, uh, another thing about grace is that it becomes operative through repentance and faith. Now, let, let's make a distinction here. The grace of God becomes operative in a person's life through repentance, through the Holy Ghost reproving of sin. Okay? Not because of repentance. There's a lot of people that think, well, you get the grace of God because you repent. Now let's, let's understand this distinction. Because what they have done is they have taken the definition of repentance and made it man changing his mind and man deciding to obey Scripture. Man cannot repent in a biblical sense. 
Man cannot change his mind and it please God. Man cannot seek salvation in any way. It takes God coming to you. See, repentance is when the Holy Ghost of God is reproving you of your sin. It is that reproof that pointed to that man that was wounded, naked, and left half dead. Amen? The Lord, when He walked up, the Good Samaritan walked up and reached down His hand, just by the fact that He had to reach His hand down for Him, showed Him His terrible plight and His awful condition. Amen? Uh, we are shown the grace of God operatively in our lives for salvation when Christ comes to us to cause us to repent. When the Word of God is being sown in our hearts and minds by the preaching of the Gospel. God is using that to bring the grace of God. Not only that you experience it through your eyes. Not only that you experience the grace of God through your ears and through the senses. But that the grace of God can come into your very soul and change you inside out and make you a new creature. Now that's the grace of God. Amen. I don't, I don't like these people that say, well, you receive the grace of God when you repent. No wonder these people like Stephen Anderson are against the doctrine of repentance. If that's what they think repentance is. You can't fix yourself. Amen. This whole idea, well, if you'll change, God will accept you. That is garbage. Amen. And it's a false doctrine. I don't care how much you believe that. You're on your way to hell if you believe that. Amen. Anyway, let's move on about grace. It's unmerited favor. It's made available to all men. And it becomes operative through repentance and faith as the gospel is preached. Fourthly, it's the only avenue for the blood of Jesus to be applied. It's the only avenue for the blood of Jesus to be applied. There are some people that say, well, Jesus died for all, so we must all be okay. You know, that's if your concept of Jesus' death giving you a ticket to heaven. You know, the New Testament never really addresses that. Never tells us to get saved so we can go to heaven. Never does. Heaven is a byproduct of being saved. But why are we saved? From our sins. We're saved from our sins. Jesus condemns sin in the flesh. In other words, He went and became that sin so that God Almighty could be assuaged of the wrath against that sin so that you and I can get the grace of God. Amen? You see it? Uh, we have to understand that the only way the blood is applied to you as an individual is if you will receive the grace of God through repentance and faith. If Christ is preaching to you right now, He's sowing the Word of God in your heart, and there's something missing in your heart, and you have to harden your neck, and you have to justify yourself, and you have to argue with God, be assured that the grace of God is trying to help you. The grace of God has showed up to you through repentance. And what He's trying to do is wash you in the blood of the Lamb so that you can be born again. Amen? Ephesians 1.7 says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. See how it all comes together? Fifthly, talking about grace, the Lord Jesus is the agent of grace. Amen. You want to know about the grace of God? Just look to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because He is the agent of grace. He is the fullness of all grace. How about John 1.14 which says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His uh, glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. <laughs> you want to you see the grace of God in one package? But we see Jesus. There it is. It is He who is grace. And you see... He is that agent. Acts 5.11 says, But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved. Acts 20.24, 20, The gospel of the grace of God. Where Galatians 1.6 says, The grace of Christ unto another gospel. The gospel is the grace of God. The grace of Christ. Revelation 22.21 says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. You know, 
He is that agent of grace. Without Christ, you don't know grace. You can sense that it exists. It's like the shadow of something. You can, you can sense that it exists. But that's as far as you can go. You'll never experience it without Christ. Sixth, the Bible is where we learn about grace. We don't learn about it from gospel songs. Amen. We learn about grace from the Bible. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he says, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. See, that's, that's grace, not only for salvation, but the grace to carry you and me through this life, this life of turmoil, this life of sin. The grace of God becomes effectual in our lives. It actually affects us. It makes us victorious. And it's only found in the Scriptures. So that tells us we must, we must be partakers of the Scriptures if we're going to be partakers of grace. Hebrews 4.16, y'all heard that just this morning. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. See, there's prayer too, isn't it? It's all through Christ and all through the Word of God that we find grace. We have to have grace to succeed in this life. And God did not leave us without grace. God gave us all the grace we need to get through this terrible life, this desert of life. Rebecca had to go a long, long way to go see her husband. And she couldn't have made it on her own. But because the grace of God had appeared to all men and she partook of the Father's grace through the Son, she had a beast carry her through that desert all the way to the Son. You see, grace endures for eternity. It never stops. It never stops. The grace of God. I was a partaker in November of 1991. And since then, I've been riding that camel across this desert until I get home. And when me and Jesus meet eye to eye, and we go into the bride's chamber called the New Jerusalem forever. You see it? A camel called grace. It's this enduring part of grace that I want to talk about. Not just the salvation of grace, but the enduring part of grace that I want to talk about. And as we study a little bit about the camel uh, as one that would carry you on a, on a long, arduous journey, uh, that's what we're going to look at, this camel called grace. And God's given us a picture here, and I believe we can use it. Now, let me point out that the camel is a natural servant of man. And they can overcome the most extreme circumstances. That's the, you got to know that about a camel. That, that's why you use a camel in the desert and not a mule. Uh, mules are stubborn, hard-headed, and they can't make it across that desert. But a camel is a natural servant of man and will go across that desert at, a, at the voice of command, will go across that desert. Uh, here's a quote I heard one time, and I wrote it down. It says, No committee could ever come up with anything as revolutionary as a camel. Anything is practical and is perfectly designed to perform effectively under such difficult conditions. See, that's a picture of the grace of God. No matter how dry, no matter how dusty, no matter how desperate this life becomes, the good Samaritan has put us on his own beast and he's put us on a camel called grace and he's bringing us home. Amen? He can survive anything. So, I want to give you four obstacles in the desert uh, that a camel is perfectly uh, equipped to conquer. And I mean, you'll conquer all four of them. Amen? So let's look at this. And we're talking about the grace of God. The first thing, when you look at a desert, uh, the first obstacle that a, that a camel has to deal with is the fact that food and water are sparse. You're not going to find a lot of food and water in the desert. But you know what I found about a camel as I was studying them? They'll eat almost anything. They'll eat anything. They'll eat whatever's there. Amen? They, you don't have to wait to get plush grass like a sheep. You don't have to wait like a cow or a horse. They will eat 
anything and they can survive on anything. I want you to know that the grace of God can use the Word of God to feed you even in the driest times. The grace of God will provide the Word of God and sometimes the Bible ain't so easy to swallow. Sometimes it's not so easy to take in, but we have the the food of the Bible. I mean, the world hates it, but I'm going to tell you what, we should love it. That camel, I mean, I can't eat what that camel eats, but that camel will just sit there and eat every bit of it. Amen? And that's us. That's what grace does. When we get saved, the Word of God becomes our necessary meat. And we love all of it, even the stuff that might even point out our sin. We love it all, man. That, that's because it, it's a camel called grace. And let me tell you what a, a camel can do. Going across the desert, even when there's no food, a camel can lose up to 40% of its uh, uh, body weight without eating and be fine. 40%. You know what that tells me? Is that we have a Bible by the grace of God, but when there's times we may be in torment, in prison, we may be in a place where we can't get a hold of a copy of the Word of God. But the grace of God can still continue on. It can take everything we've read and bring it back to our minds. The grace of God will go further than anybody could ever imagine. Just like that old camel. We'll all be hungry and run out of jerky. Weeks and that camel's still just going on through that desert and getting you where you need to go. See, food and water are sparse. They have glands. The camel have, camels have glands uh, specially designed to hold water. And these glands expand 240%. <laughs> now, <laughs> think about that just for a second. See, he doesn't use more water. He stores more water. And... You look in the Word of God and you can see that the Word of God uses water to teach us of the Spirit. Jesus told the woman at the well, He said, man, out of your water, out of your belly shall flow rivers of water. He's talking about the Spirit of God. Amen? Uh, When they poured their libations out in their ceremonies, that was a picture of the Spirit being poured. Amen? When the, the water came out of the rock, that was a picture of, of the Holy Spirit coming forth from Christ to, to give us a quenching of, of our eternal thirst in sin. Amen? So I, I want you to know that these camels can hold water 240 times better than any other creature. And as we see the picture of the water being the Spirit, God tells us to walk in the Spirit and we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What that means, my friends, is because we're being carried on a camel called grace, we've got plenty of spirit, no matter how dry it is around us, no matter how sparse the water is around us, even if there's not a church, if you're born again, God's Spirit will still bring the grace of God and carry you through this life. Amen? God is good. See, we don't rely on the flesh as the worldlings do. We rely on the Word of God and the Spirit of God and they were both brought by the grace of God. Now, like I said, this camel doesn't store any more water than the other animal. It just holds on to whatever it takes in. See, we don't have to be smart to understand the Bible. Just trust the Spirit's leading and read it. Amen? We're born again by the Spirit, according to the Word of God. That's what it says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which abideth forever. The Bible says we're born again 
by the Word of God and by the Spirit. My friends, that grace of God that brought us the Word and brought us the Spirit, that day He was trying to reprove you of your sin and to save you from your sin and to take you out of a place called hell is the same grace that will give you the same amount of the Spirit and the same amount of the Word of God so that you can go through this dry and dusty land. And you know how you're doing it? You've been picked up out of a ditch, half dead, wounded, naked, beaten down, and you've been healed and put on a camel called grace. And He's going to take you all the way to Jesus. You see why I like the camel in this? So that's obstacle number one. Food and water are sparse. Second thing, a camel has to overcome in the desert, and he does quite well, is extreme temperatures. Camels have a huge fluctuation of body heat. Now, I know uh, people are, what, 98.6, supposed to be. Mine's not that. I'm more low 97 uh, is where I'm at, or or sometimes even 96. So if I get a fever of 101, it's like somebody getting a fever of 103. Uh, But what I'm trying to point out here is that our our temperature cannot fluctuate that much. If it does, it'll bake our brain, man. But a camel can fluctuate. As a matter of fact, a camel fluctuates its inner core temperature between 94 degrees and 107 degrees unheard of no other creature can do that it perfectly deals with heat you see something i've learned about deserts uh of course y'all in el centro can really amen this because i think y'all quench your thirst with dirt but um one thing i found about being in a desert and, and i never was in a desert until we went out to fort Irwin, california in the mojave desert in the daytime, it was blistering heat. We'd take our MREs, you know, those little meals you get, sea rations for some of y'all, uh, and we'd put them in, in, the, in the sand uh, in the morning, and then when we come back for lunch, we'd pull them out of that sand, and I'm telling you what, you'd have hot soup. It'd be hot. You'd have good hot stuff. But at night, it got extremely cold. You think, how in the world can it be so hot in the day And then so cold at night. And see, we as Christians, we face the hot and cold. And what I mean by that is we'll face the hotness of persecution. The hotness of temptation. The heat of the devil being on us. The heat of putting up the trial by fire and having to deal with the things of this world and the flesh. But we also have to deal with the cold. How many times have we grown idle? How many times does it seem like the book is closed to us? How many times does it seem like to us maybe heaven is a brass and and, and we can't get through to God? There's just times of extreme coldness we go through. So we can't depend on ourselves. Thank God the good Samaritan picked us up. He put us on a camel called Grace. So in times of extreme persecution, we're still being carried across. In times when we get a little cold, we're still being carried across. Amen. It's the grace of God that pulls us through this life because a camel can face intense fluctuations of temperature. So can the grace of God. Do you know what camels do in hot temperatures? This is kind of blow your mind. Where we... It gets hot. We all want to separate. Go find shade pour water on us. Camels huddle together. I don't understand this, but it's been found when camels come together, there is less heat flowing between them touching each other and just the camel in the air. That's different than us, isn't it? So they'll huddle together in hot temperatures. I think that's interesting. You know, when things get hot in your life or things get cold, you know where you need to be? By the grace of God, huddled together. It's called the church of Jesus Christ. In our metaphor of the Good Samaritan, it's the inn. And we're going to talk about that inn. You won't believe all the things that you can look at about an inn describes the church as well. it's, It's just interesting. We'll talk about that in the weeks to come. But we need fellow believers because fellow believers are the answer of grace when we are persecuted. 
There's something about a camel's fur that prevents them from sweating too much. I don't know what it is. It's a camel. Go ask a camel. Ask God whenever we see him. But whenever they get all hot, they don't just go off individual and pant. No, they come to the church. Don't you remember when Peter was in prison in Acts chapter 12 and the angel broke him out? And I still believe God does things like that. And he was broke out and he comes up and he walks up to Mark's house. John Mark, the guy that wrote the book of Mark under inspiration, knocks on his door and they're in there having prayers about Peter. When persecution hit, they didn't all just run and go, well, Peter shouldn't have got caught. No, God by His grace gave a church and look where Peter went. Right to the church. Now the funny thing was, is a little girl named Rhoda answered the door. It's Peter. Peter's here. They said, oh no, they've killed him. It's his ghost. Can I ask you something? Just a real quick question. What were they praying about according to the Acts 12? God rescuing Peter. And then he shows up. And they don't believe it. Thank God for grace because we're just about the stupidest creatures ever made, aren't we, in some ways? God makes it so clear to us and we're just so stupid. We're so accidentally defiant, we don't even understand it. But there's a camel called grace. You see in that desert, I run out of stuff to eat and drink. I'll run out, I'll get hot, I'll get too cold. But there's a camel that is designed to withstand that and will carry me through. And I thank God that He gives me this picture so that I can see His grace. Let me give you another one. Sand. (laughs) Sand is a trial. Sand is an obstacle. And you have two kinds of sand in the desert that have to be dealt with. First of all, there's the sand that blows fiercely. Strips everything uh, that gets in its way. I remember when we went out to Mojave Desert, we dealt with that sand. And in my uniform, I, I spilt some apple jelly on my uniform right here. And I was on my way to a mission and Riding a truck and bouncing and jelly fell on my uniform right there. Not, well, what's the big deal? We'll wash it when we can. Uh-uh. When, when I got out and I'm out there all day working, that sand was blasting my uniform, blasting my face. We were chafed. We had to keep stuff around our face. And it so permeated that, that jelly that it became like a permanent starch. I mean, hard. Uh, man, you couldn't break it. It, it, that's that's what happened. That's how that sand permeated. I looked down at my boots. Now, back when I was in, you actually had to polish your boots. I mean, of course, these days, you know, they got away from polishing, so boys could wear pumps, I guess. But um, <coughs> we had to polish them boots, man. They had to be spit shot. But you're out there in the desert. I looked down, and the whole face and the back of my boots just looked like suede because of this fierce sand hitting us and stripping us. And I, I'm going to tell you, I, when I look at that, we, we could, and, and, you know, we can make a type out of anything. I've already said that. But boy, when we're talking about a camel called Grace taking us across the desert, see, that sand ain't only going to hit the camel. That sand's going to hit us. We need something's going to be able to carry us through that. Because all we can do is really bury ourselves from that sand. But if we just stay still, that sand will bury us. You see? But the camel, this will blow your mind, it has very, very heavy eyelashes. You ever seen pictures of a camel, you know, and when they make a kind of a character of a camel, they always have these big old eyelashes. You ever notice that? Well, there's a reason for that. Sand. Now get this. You probably didn't know this. They have three eyelids. They have three eyelids. So while you're all hovering because of the sand and because whatever trial is trying to beat you down, whatever fierce wind is blowing in your face and trying to destroy everything, there's this camel that just puts down another eyelid and keeps on blinking his way through it. Takes you right through it. It, It's the grace of God. And what God will do in the midst of a trial, a fiery trial, a a, a persecuting trial, a persevering trial, something that you just can't seem to get over. And For me, it was the 40s. Amen? It's this constant trial, it seemed like. 
But there was this camel called Grace. And what would happen is that camel can still see where he's going because of those eyelashes. And because of those, those uh, eyelids, he's got those three eyelids. And what could happen is he could see the direction that we needed to go, even though I couldn't. And that's what the grace of God does in the most extreme circumstances when you're under trials, is He'll cause you to see His will even in the midst of a trial, and you can just keep on going. Amen. I'm going to tell you what else about a camel. He has special nostrils that can shut down and keep him from inhaling sand. Just protects him from that sand blowing up his nose. Can you imagine us out there? But that camel's equipped for it, you see. See, if I ever get to the point I don't, I can't breathe, I just want to quit. I mean, I quit. I can't breathe. Amen. But I'm going to tell you something. That's not how a camel is. That's not how the grace of God is. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you but such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it? You say, how does a Christian deal with temptation? How is it that you, my friend, have an ability to not fall into temptation and I don't? I'm going to tell you how. The grace of Almighty God, that's how. It's the effective, enduring grace of God that carries me through a fiery trial. So that sand is an obstacle, isn't it? But see, that's just the blowing sand. What about the sand you got to walk on on the desert floor? How long can you wear sandals and go across the desert before you wear them things out? Not long. I want you to know, if I was to see anything in that sand that I have to walk across, it's the chastening of God. God has never been abusive toward me. God has never over zealously punished me. But it seems like in my walk of grace, there's a lot that I step on and go, oh, e, ah, oh, e, ah, to keep me in line. Isn't that about how, how it is? Let me tell you something. <laughs> Camels have cushioned bottoms. Okay, their feet have cushioned bottoms, real cushioned. Surrounded by extra tough skin. That sand doesn't chase their skin, chafe their skin. If they step on a rock, they just step on a rock. They don't go, oh, and jump. Because of the way their feet are made. You understand? Whether it's through a fiery trial or, through, or it's a time where God is having to chasten you because of sin, Still on that camel called Grace. And He's the one carrying you through that trial and through that chastening to get to your husband. Let me give you one more. The problem with the desert is you have to be carried to cross it. You cannot cross it on your own. Just watch the good, the bad, and the ugly. You'll know what I mean. That was a joke. Keep you awake. Okay? Um, boy, you, uh, if I remember right, I hadn't seen it since I was a kid. Most boring movie ever, but but I remember seeing him with those parched lips trying to cross that desert and how horrible that was. I thought, boy, I don't ever want to be in a desert, you know, going across. But, the, but that's the truth. You, you cannot cross the desert without being carried. You can't do it. This is a vast desert, this life that we're in, to get to our Lord one day. And to see Him face to face and when all of our trials are over, it's a vast desert and you can't carry yourself through it. But did you know that another name for the camel is the ship of the desert? Did you know that? It's the, called the ship of the desert. And it can carry three times its own weight. Three times its own weight. So you got a camel, what do they weigh? 200 pounds, 400 pounds, I don't know. If he's a 400-pound camel, it means he can carry 1,200 pounds. Now, I may be a little bit portly, you know, in my latter years, but I don't weigh 1,200 pounds. Matter of fact, if I have 1,200 pounds to put on a camel, that's everything I've got. 
That's me and my wife, my guitar, my Bible. That's just about everything I need. Right? That camel can carry me no matter how heavy it becomes. He's the ship of the desert. Jesus, that, that's why He said, My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You would think a yoke is hard because you think of a yoke, you know, you put it on an ox and he has to pull a plow. But Jesus says, no matter how hard that looks to you, let me tell you something, my yoke is easy. My burden is light because I'm the one that bears the burden. He's the one that took away our sin and he's also the one that can carry us away from our old sin. Sometimes the flesh likes, amen? See, grace will carry you all the way home. It's eternal. That means that if you're God's, you stay God's. No matter how heavy the load gets. Now, if you got to cross this desert, okay, you need to be on something that's going to carry you. And ship of the desert is perfect. But another thing is you have to keep a steady pace or you'll never make it. You will never make it if you don't keep a steady pace. At some point, you're going to wear out, draw up, die, something. You have to keep a steady pace. Did you know that a camel can pace itself at 10 miles an hour for 18 hours? See why we call it a camel called grace? For 18 hours. He can go 10 miles an hour. See, that's why we believe that when you're saved, you will endure. That's why we believe that when a person's truly saved and they've been introduced to the grace of God and they've been put on that camel called grace, that though they have to cross the desert, you won't see their bones all dried up someplace where they failed. They're going to be carried all the way through. You see them 20 years go by, they're still serving God. It's because of grace. It's not because we're holding on to Him. It's because He's got us. See, the Good Samaritan put me on His own beast and is carrying me all the way to see the husbandman. <clears throat> That's why we believe in when it says His commandments are not grievous. It's the grace that makes us want to do His commandments. You say, but preacher, I, I just can't keep up with other Christians. I just can't keep up with them. It's not about keeping up with other Christians. It's about your camel. It's about your desert. Because I want to tell you what a camel does. He doesn't just take off running. They start out incredibly slow. And they gradually speed up. That's how a camel does. Isn't that a picture? If you look back at your Christian life, isn't that exactly how it was? You start off just kind of learning and growing. You're looking around. In Korea, when you arrive there, we call you a turtle. Because what you do, you being American and never being in the Orient, you know, you get there and you're walking real slow and you're looking around a lot. Like a turtle does. But at some point, you stop being a turtle. At some point, you can just walk right through it. Yeah, there's a restaurant over here and that's a barber shop and it's not strange to you anymore. You remember when you first became a Christian and you came to church and you'd hear the preacher say things and you'd go, oh, I never thought of that. Or you'd call the preacher or another brother and say, listen to what I read today. The preacher says, yeah, I just preached on that last Sunday. You did? <laughs> right? It seems like we... It, it, it seems like we just kind of slow. We look around a lot and the next thing you know we gradually... Speed up. And I want to tell you, when it comes to the desert, a camel can outrun a horse in the desert. That thing will carry you right out of danger. Amen? Where a horse can keep you right in the middle of it. That's why Isaiah 40 and verse 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Thou shalt mount up with wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. And a camel is so patient. They're not in a hurry to get anywhere. Now I just shut my Bible, which was insane. I'm up here preaching. I don't know why I would ever do that. 
But look back at Genesis 24. And uh, verse 64. See, that camel called Grace is so incredibly patient. God is so long-suffering with us. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Amen. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. God is so patient as we cross our desert to finally be with our Son and see Him as He is, which is our blessed hope. We are looking for the blessed hope. Titus uh, chapter 2, verses 9 through 11 tells us that the grace of God's appeared to all men that brings salvation. And it says it teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, that we can live righteously and soberly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace causes us to be patient and to look for Jesus. Amen. Don't look for the answer in the desert. Look for the husbandman who's the God of all, who, whose beast we are on. Because Genesis 6, or 24, 64 says, And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. I don't mean she lit a cigarette, boys and girls. Okay, I mean she got off the camel. It is grace hath brought me Safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. We sing that song through many dangers, toils, and snares. I've already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe this far, and grace will lead me home. Now I'm going to tell you, a camel looks very awkward when you first meet a camel. They just look awkward. But so does salvation by grace. If you've been trusting your goodness or your works or your religion. But I'm going to tell you, get on that awkward beast called grace and let God carry you to salvation. God's grace is His unmerited favor toward you to reach down to you through the preaching of repentance and to show you your true need. And when you realize that need, he pulls you up out of the dregs of sin and puts you on his own beast. And today we call it a camel called grace. And he will lead you home. Amen? It's the only way to inherit salvation. And I pray if anything in this message, I pray that it has encouraged us to rely on the grace of God. Use the grace gifts to make our church go. Not votes, programs, the grace gifts. Amen? Rely on the grace of the gospel to save souls and not, not our advertisement, marketing, and programs. And to rely on the grace of God to carry us through persecution, chastening, fiery trials, and not of ourselves because we can't do it. The enduring grace of God is like a camel, is it not? Let's pray.